On this week's Throwdown, we have Meaty Mike and Kinky Kyle demoing the workout. No! <laughs> we have Devil's Press, Burpee Box Jump Overs, and a 1RM Hang Squat Clean. We release these workouts right here on YouTube every Thursday at 1 p.m. Join our entire community to practice the skill of competing. Use the next two days to plan a strategy, grab some friends, and throw down on Saturday. See where you stack up each week on our Throwdown leaderboard. It's free to sign up. Go to trainingthinktank.com slash throwdown. This week's throwdown from zero to seven minutes, 12, nine, six, three of double dumbbell devil's press and burpee box jump overs. At the seven minute mark, you have until 14 minutes to establish a one rep max hang squat clean. This week's demo athletes are two training think tank coaches, Kyle Ruth, Mike McGoldrick, both almost masters athletes. Kyle is a masters athlete that's finished in the top 50 in the world in the CrossFit Games online age group qualifier. And Mike McGoldrick is a dad who's almost a master and he's real powerful. When you watch the workout, the major separator in this workout for them is the devil's press speed and the transitions. So pay attention, we'll talk about that. And in the hang clean, they hit between 90 and 94% of their current 1RMs in the full squat clean, so that can give you perspective on how to approach the 1RM under fatigue. For the movement standards, we wanted to point out that you must touch your chest to the ground in between the dumbbells for each of the devil's press, and for the hang squat clean, as long as you stand up to start the lift, you can do a hang clean any way you'd like. High hang, mid hang, low hang, have fun. This week, on site, Noel Olson's here. We're prepping for the CrossFit Games, so stay tuned on our YouTube channel for some stuff that we're gonna release, but I don't know what. Let's go see Mike's strategy. My strategy is to not be soft on the 12963. That's gonna be a pretty nasty part of the workout. And then for the clean, my strategy is to hopefully not look like a drunk guy waking up for work the next morning after an all-night bender, starting the first clean. So 1296. At least the 12 and 9, I'll probably pace pretty smoothly. My goal is just to basically speed up each set of the movement. So I'm not going to go out super hot on the 12 uh, double press or the 12 burpee box jump over. 9, I like to go a little faster, 6 even faster, and then 3 finish really strong just because it's a quick turnover for 3 reps. Um, I think I'll open at like 225 or so for the hand clean just to like feel it, make sure positions are good. And then I'll start building pretty aggressively since the time frame is really short. I don't like to take a lot of lifts like in a short time window. So hopefully hit like 335 or so, it'd be cool. There was no strategy for Kyle. <laughs> well, Kyle just <laughs> Kyle's hopped, strategy hopped was beat Mike. Dominated. He wasn't even on the demo. He just came in and decided to dominate. I would like to point out that you should be going faster as the reps decrease each round. <laughs> so good job, Mike. <laughs> What would you see the major differences separation-wise in terms of why Kyle's reps here are faster? Yeah, you'll see if you watch the difference as they come down, I think that's the biggest difference. Is they're basically going up the same speed. Both of them drive the dumbbells overhead pretty fast. But Kyle's pulling the dumbbells down in the shoulder, and it's almost like a brush. Yeah. Whereas Mike, it, it, he's still moving fast, don't get me wrong, but the difference of that half second every single rep makes a huge difference when you're talking about a sprint workout like this. So the difference was 14 seconds in the devil's press. Yeah, Mike also has that little, like, it's almost like a kettlebell swing into putting it down back on the ground on the way down and on the way up, whereas Kyle's only doing it on the way up. Yeah. And in this set of 12 devil's press, that's a 14 second difference. On a short workout, that's a pretty substantial amount of time. Yeah, I really like to getting, once I put the dumbbells down, I'm trying to drive my chest into the ground as quickly as possible, almost like I'm basically just doing a body weight burpee and then let the dumbbells swing between my legs as I come up. All right, now Mike's finished and he's a couple reps behind. So both of them had really fast transitions. Mike's setup was probably a little bit better because he had the dumbbells basically kind of right next to his box, whereas Kyle walked, but they were both two seconds fast. That's what you have to do. Even if you start redlining a workout like this, I think you have to transition quickly. And then if you need to kind of regulate yourself, you just pull back on the movement speed of the rep. So this, oh, no Mia, go ahead. I'm you here too, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Stay away. Um, so if you watch the way they come off the box, Kyle hops off and Mike steps off, but Kyle, after he hops, he still takes two steps to reset his feet. So the, like, even though he has that jump off, he's not actually coming off the box any faster. Yeah, that set of 12 took 50 seconds and Mike's about to finish and it takes 50 seconds for both of them. So two completely different strategies. Mike is rotating, stepping off, and then stepping back into his burpee. Kyle is jumping off then rotating, taking two steps and going back and ends up being the same pace. I think a quick takeaway there is you have to practice both and see what works. I think for most people, the step off is probably the best way to go in a workout where you have to pace. But if it is a sprint style, and this probably isn't 
a true sprint for some people, you do have to jump off, hit your chest to the ground, and try to get up as quickly as possible. Yeah, if you want to jump off and have it be fast, you have to turn as you're jumping so you don't have to turn yeah. around once you hit the ground because then you're just using the same amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. And kick your feet back quickly. And that just makes those reps way more taxing, I for think. For sure. Yeah. The, it's a lot, it's a very marginal difference in the speed gain that you get, but a lot more in terms of effort. Yeah. So probably more something that would be focused on by elites. And now Kyle just went to the step in that rep right there. So now he's stepping off all of them. Yeah, I think you know talking to Kyle after the workout, one of the things that he had in his mind since they were obviously going against each other was, I want to find a way to speed up my first round so that I'm ahead, and then I can kind of dictate my pace based on where Mike is, try to beat him by a rep each round. So that was his way of, I'm going to jump off, even though it probably wasn't that much yeah. faster, thinking it was faster, and then now he knows where Mike is in the workout. Yeah, it's a. I feel like that's race psychology. Kyle swam his whole life, so you know he's thinking about things in in a race setting. And I, it is nice in a short workout to be ahead and just have sure. a lead. It's just it does something psychologically. You can be a little bit calmer in your transitions, especially if you're going head to head. Maybe in a workout where you have ten people and there's lanes, that's harder to keep focus on unless you can really get ahead. But I think in a head to head format like this can definitely be beneficial psychologically. Brandon, I've heard you talk a lot about coming out fast and just expecting deterioration to happen anyways and like banking time while you can. Yeah. And I hate doing that in workouts because that's the opposite of my nature. But whenever I do it, I do better. <laughs> yeah. It just I think makes obviously it there's so much worse. There's a balance there where you can't just completely trash right, yourself in the sure. first round. But I do think that there is a psychological advantage and, and there probably is some good data on just the way that we do deteriorate, that there's a physiological advantage there too. It just depends on the type of workout and the movements that you're doing. So I just wanted to point out to Mia here, there's a really cute judge over there judging Kyle, don't you think? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what does that have to do with Kyle? <laughs> I really like Mike's dip under on the devil's press. I think that's really smart, especially if you if the overhead is gonna tax you, it makes it a lot easier on the press. Yeah, that, um, he just finishes set, that transition there, there is actually some lost transition time. So after the set of nine Devils press, he lost four seconds to Kyle, and then after that set of um, Devils press, he lost four seconds, or two, four seconds, two seconds and two seconds on the next two transitions. That time adds up in a short workout. So you might have to be mindful of that depending on how close to your potential you want to go. And you see when he's going to the threes, he gets off the box and goes right to the dumbbells. So those little things start to become details that matter for people where it's not like, all right, this isn't about fitness now. It's about just moving a little, with a little bit more urgency to finish. Yeah. For sure. One of the things that Mike did in the last round that I'm not a huge fan of is like the really slow kickback. If you're gonna do the step down and then step back, you've gotta kick back fast. Yeah. All right, so Kyle's done, 501. Mike's done, 526. Most of that time, like we talked about, is in the devil's press speed and a little bit in the transition. The burpee box jump over pace was almost exactly the same. Then, now, 1RM hang clean. Yeah, so, so for those at home, you can take a lift, it just doesn't count. So if you wanna warm up, I don't think anybody really <laughs> is gonna have time or want to, but the way that we set this up is, you know, you can kinda gamify it a little bit and say, I'm gonna take a lift, kinda get a feel for where I wanna be, and then maybe just add load, but at the seven minute mark is when you can start counting your lifts. So is people at home- gamify a word? Yeah, sure. Oh, I think so. If not, Leave me we alone. made it. Work. <laughs> <laughs> people at home will take a lift, and people in the video will take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, is Mike was talking about it. He's like going to be messed up. I've seen him way more messed up than this one, and it doesn't matter for his lifts. Yeah, he's, he's still so just strong. so strong. Yeah. He started at my max. Congratulations. Yeah, he uh, was going to start at 225. Do you think he got angry that Kyle beat him and wanted to flex on him right yeah, away? Well, not really sure. He definitely didn't stick to his strategy. This is the best part oh, of the and video. Here's his little baby boy. What's up, little man? <laughs> Just chilling here, watching Dad. No little, big deal. Red nose. I wish I could just hear what's going on through his head. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he is really yeah. staring. There's a smile. That's probably Mom. There's no way that was Chris that yeah, made him smile. No. Not with that big damn camera lens in his face. <laughs> One of the things that Mike did throughout all of his lifts is he added, you can't see them here because they're inside of the 25s, but he added one pound change plates. And I think that moving forward, that's just kind of going to be the nature of the game. To gamify it again a little bit yeah. more, you have to kind of play the game of if every, like say, males, the average for the top 
150 is going to be 335, then maybe it is 337 for you to move up the leaderboard. So Kyle just took his first lift pretty close to the, like, right when the window opened up, 245. Mike stepping in. At, he was supposed to be at 225, but he's at 277. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit different. Yeah. He actually looks pretty fresh, though. I mean, given that he's uh, two minutes post Metcon here, his, you know, respiration, all that stuff looks pretty good. And then, like usual, he has gorilla speed on the barbell. So Mike does not necessarily the bop bop or the bounce off the hip, but pretty close to it. And then Kyle does a low hang clean. Like he brings it down below his knees, which it's pretty interesting how different that is. Yeah, I mean, he, Mike is basically a true high hang and he's really powerful from that position. So, I, you know, this is I think one of those things where what's the best position for me? And this is another thing that you can kind of start practicing if you have like, you know, eight sets of two or you're doing the EMOM with hang cleans, play around with your positions and see what works within the constraints of the standards that come out in the qualifier. Yeah, so some people might not have clear data on their hang clean and know exactly where that is. So just as a reference point, we'll get through it and we'll give you the exact numbers, but Mike ends up hitting 94% of his everyday 1RM full clean and Kyle ends up hitting 90% of his current 1RM squat clean in the hang clean. So that can kind of give a barometer for people, maybe somewhere between 85 and 95% of your full clean if you're quasi-technically proficient. Yeah. At what age are you allowed to use your current maxes yeah. versus your... <laughs> yeah, versus your lifetime. Because you do that all the time yeah. when you claim you beat me. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way that I lift. Yeah. Oh yeah, Kyle's below the knee. So yeah. that lift is there, successful, 285. Mike's stepping up to 307. Sorry, I cut you off. You yeah. can get back in and the rest. And no problem. Yeah, good really work. good. Very powerful. Yeah, I was going to say that you know 90 to 95% is basically what you see elite males and females hit in qualifiers from the yeah. data that we have. I think the average is like 93%. So Mike hitting almost 95% is super impressive. And he was pretty close to 352, which would have been over that. Yeah. And that, one of the things I want to point out too is that they started probably closer to their 70%. So that may be something that people kind of look at before, like what's my 70% or what's something that I know I can hit every single day, even under fatigue, and that's your starting lift. Yeah, and they both end up taking five attempts. So that gives that's five attempts over the course of seven minutes, which is what, that's like a, a minute, 15 minute, 20 per lift. So if you're going to end up taking more than that, you can start a little bit lighter, but you're going to be going like maybe on a 45 second clock or on a 50 second clock to get those extra attempts in. Yeah. I do think their last, and you'll see this soon, but their last lifts were a little bit in an unrealistic time frame of the time that they had to rest to hit it. Mm. So maybe being a little bit more aggressive on the front end so that you have more rests at the end, whereas they kind of were the opposite. They were taking more rest at the beginning and had to rush their lifts at the end. Since they're resting, to go back to your question, you're allowed to use your current 1RM at one year older than whatever your age is <laughs> from now on. Forever, forever. <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> Bam, stood yeah. up pretty powerful. So that's 327. That's quite heavy. I mean, it still looks really good. Crashed on him a little bit. I, I think that's probably the only thing that ever happens to Mike because this pool's just always yeah. insanely good. So it, the thing is too is like even if it crashes on him, he's so strong at keeping it vertical and standing it up. Yeah, this uh, this structure of well, hold on, let's watch Kyle's attempt in the background. This is three hundo and a fail. So it looked like the bar was a little bit forward and just he maybe wasn't set enough in the catch there. But he takes another run at it. We'll see. Um, I forgot what I was going to say before. Way to go. <laughs> I do. Both of them had ideas of where they wanted to be at the end of this, right? Whether they told it to the camera or not. So Mike already knew exactly what the next weight was going to be, give or take maybe five pounds if one felt really good or really bad. But he had his weight ready. So one of the things, I know most people do this, but like Mia said, plan out the times that you're going to do it so you don't rush that last lift. And then also make sure that you have the change plates ready or the, the fives and the tens so that you can put those on quickly to get to the next load that you want to hit. Yeah, what I was going to say earlier was that the work workout structure oftentimes dictates what percentage of your actual lift you're going to be able to hit. So something like 18.2 and 18.2a, it was 10 or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and it was front squat and bar facing burpee. So you're basically crushing the legs and the metabolic system 
which then impacted the clean yeah. really badly for a lot of people. This, Devil's Press is kind of a hinge movement, and then the burpee box jump is kind of a hinge and a jump movement, so it might not affect the squat as much, maybe more so the pull for people. Yes. Um, just something to take into consideration as you're trying to learn how to lift under fatigue. You can't do that much training of it, so a lot of times you have to give yourself some sort of a thought process um, and a plan going into it and set some realistic expectations. Ooh, both oh, yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and Mike's fired up. Kyle's right 300 there. again. He gets it much better nice. lift there. Oh, yeah. Probably Mike's best lift. Yeah, Mike at 342. So on that lift, he, he kind of the wings on his <laughs> chest. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, kind of bent his arms and kind of it looked like he almost sets it on his thighs. That's a technique that I've seen a lot of people use. That's really successful. It maybe wouldn't translate directly to a full clean off the floor where you can't put the bar in that position, but if you're learning different techniques to to uh, to go through a test like this that could potentially come up, that could be a beneficial thing to have and good for the, like the bop bop strategy for barbell cycling. So they both went up 10 pounds. You're gonna see Kyle here at 310. Mike's gonna be 352, and you know, this is tough because they only had like a minute and five seconds now to rest, which is kind of one of those things that Mia was talking about earlier but I do think maximize the rest here. You're only gonna get one attempt. It's not gonna pick it back up. So wait until, you know, 1350 or whatever that may be for you where you can successfully hit the lift. And the bar just has to be off of the ground at 14. Nice. For it to count. So they could have even milked this time a little bit longer. About to see. What's gonna happen? <laughs> the anticipation. Oh yeah, it's killing me. <laughs> Mike, scream there. They won't be able to hear that. Oh. <laughs> 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 Great job, guys. Right, there it is. What are you saying over there, Mike? Um, I'm talking trash about Hunt's <laughs> 150 pounds more than I can squat right now. <laughs> All right, good job, guys. Project Pat, do what it is, what it do, whatever you say. <laughs> it's a wrap, you know what I'm saying? Your boy Project Pat in this thing, man. Hey, look, man. Thank y'all for watching Train Think Tank YouTube channel. Y'all hit that motherfucking subscribe button, you know what I'm saying? So y'all go ahead, man. Thank y'all for watching the channel, you know what I'm saying? Hit that motherfucking subscribe button. Let it be known what it be known what it be known, you know what I'm saying? Hot